Samsara beats a retreat. Samsara beats a retreat. And that's nice because it's like when you personify inanimate things. It's like an alankara. It's a figure of speech. When you personify inanimate things. And so samsara is animate or inanimate? Inanimate. Samsara is Jada, right? But the Jada here is made Chetana on purpose and it has been given the power of the legs to walk away. Perfect. Wonderful. There is a solution for everything. Thank you. So when samsara walks away from you, it's kind of nice. And that gives us a very beautiful understanding. How come this samsara that is jada has become chetana? Please come here. Lots of rooms. So how did this samsara, which is jada, become chetana, this dead samsara? Samsara is not alive. How here it is alive? It has grown legs, it has grown hands, and it is saying bye-bye with the hands, and then it is walking away from me with the legs. How did this happen to this samsara? Who made samsara alive? Ah. This jiva only gave the power to this thing called samsara, which is a non-entity, to this non-entity called samsara, the agnya, the person of no uh, knowledge, no self-knowledge, has empowered samsara in order not only to be animated and alive, but to be scary. <laughs> So this scary thing, when will it leave me? Because I feel possessed. I feel possessed by samsara. I feel that samsara is very much alive for me. And then what does samsara does the favor to me after I gain knowledge by walking away. <laughs> very nicely put. And so this is Adi Shankara. This is why it is Adi Shankara. And um, so, Jnana Agnana Hanaya, the destruction of this Agnanam is equal to the Vinivritti, the return of Samsara. Samsara returns itself, retraces its steps, and goes away. And so, because it is Vithya, just the world is brighter than before. The world is no longer, there is, I'm not living under a teacup of my own pains, fears, etc. I'm not living under a subjective teacup, a thick teacup of like a covering. And so there is release from the sorrow.
<laughs> it's like those children's uh, puzzles. Uh, in India, sometimes in rural areas, for children, uh, some entertainers come and all the children will be in a circle. There is drumming, there is some pa pa pa, all that is there. And then the one man is blindfolded and he's put in the center of the circle and he has a sidekick. And the sidekick says loudly, what is the child in the pink dress? What is she wearing? What color is she wearing? <laughs> and the blindfolded man says, pink, <laughs> gulabi. And then, and then everybody goes, and the children don't know this. You know, the children go, ha ah, you must be psychic. How did you know? <laughs> it's like that. So the word, the, the compound has only two words, Brahma Vidya, Vidhanaya. I explained Vidhanaya. And then what is the next word? Abba. Okay. Child in the pink dress. What is she wearing? Brahma Vidya. So that is the one. Brahma Vidya, Vidhanaya. Prarabdhopanishad tu iyam. This is a little bit of a head scratcher. Kathopanishad, I have heard of if not studied. Kenopanishad, yes, check, I have heard of. And then what else? Mundaka Upanishad, Mandukya Upanishad, this Upanishad, that Upanishad, I have heard of. Check, check, check. But Prarabdha Upanishad, I have not heard of. This must be a new Upanishad. Ooh, wonderful. Prarabdha plus Upanishad, Prarabdha Upanishad. And Upanishad, that is going to delineate my own Prarabdha. Wrong. <laughs> the word Prarabdha itself means Prak Arabdham. Prarabdha means began, that which has been begun before. So, tu iyam, tu indeed, iyam, this feminine, because Upanishad is feminine. In fact, every pursuit in life is feminine. And the pursuits are mainly two. What does everybody want? Happiness. That is feminine. That is a kind of a Lakshmi, feminine. And the source of happiness is money. That is also a kind, another kind of Lakshmi. What kind of Lakshmi? Uh, so whoever said Saraswati, see me uh, in after class immediately. It's an emergency. So, so, so Lakshmi of wealth. Dhana Lakshmi. Lakshmi in the form of food. Dhanya Lakshmi. Lakshmi in the form of children. Santana Lakshmi. Lakshmi in the form of feeling good and victorious over everyone. Jaya Lakshmi. Vijaya Lakshmi. Jaya Lakshmi. So many Lakshmis. And if you say, you know what? I want knowledge. I don't want all these things. What's that? Saraswati. Upanishad, all of them are feminine. All of them are feminine. What is that noise? <laughs> huh? Water. Ah, okay. It knows when the class timings are. It must. It knows when the meditation also is. Prarabdha iyam Upanishad. Iyam Upanishad tu. Indeed, this Upanishad is begun. Prakarshena Arabdha with a big bang. There Prarabdha is Prak Arabdha. Here it is Prakarshena Arabdha Prarabdha. Means forcefully 
possibly with a big bang, this Upanishad has begun. Which Upanishad? Where? How? Called Upadesha Sahasri. What a lovely landing. Ah. After talking about everything, after decrying karma as a means to moksha, after ridding one of all the all the things connected to the penchant for having this what is that called? You know, having this addiction to karma. Then it is said, now this Upanishad is begun. It is begun. Then you may ask, what is this Upanishad that is given in the next verse? Let us chant that. Sade Rupa Nipur Vasya Vipichopanishad Bhavet Mandi Karana Bhavacha Garbha Deshatanatatha So now he gives a very nice verse. It's a very unlike verse. Unlike any other verse we have seen in this chapter, the verse is talking about why it is called Upanishad. So why is it called Upanishad? The word Upanishad is analyzed. The Vyutpati, the grammatical derivation, is analyzed. And Adi Shankara is famous for this. He has done this in the Katho Upanishad and in the Mundaka Upanishad. Everywhere he analyzes the word Upanishad itself. So the Upanishad is what? It is a word with two prefixes. Upa and Ni. Purvasya means that which has two prefixes. Upani. And then Sadi Rupasya. Sadehe Rupasya. So Sadi becomes Sadehe. Sad is the word. But that word sad, root verb, is sad. And we'll see the meaning. That root verb, if it is preceded by e, becomes sh. Sad becomes what? Shad. In koho, there is one sutra. Adesha pratyayoho. So by that Paninian sutra, if it is preceded by e, um, uh, so what will happen? The Upanishad will become Upanishad. Now it's still not a verb. Sad is not a verb. It's a root verb. You can't just have a, a word with simple prefixes. It should also have a either a nominal or a verbal suffix. It's not enough to have prefix. What should it have? Suffix. It should either be a noun or a verb or an adjective or an adverb. Something it should have the correct and uh, adjective is also treated like a noun in Sanskrit. So it should have either a nominal suffix or a verbal suffix in order to be a, a word. But here there is no su suffix. Upanishad. Upanishad. Sad, I told you, is the is the root verb. How is it a uh, uh, how is it can be called a word? Well, there is something interesting that is going on. There is a suffix, an invisible suffix called quip, which equips the word Upanishad <laughs> with a sense of agency. Like in English also, the sense of agency is, is derived through the suffix er. Eat, eater. Drink, drinker. Do, doer. Experience, experiencer. We, we have this. Drive, 
driver cook why everybody is silent cook nobody said cooker cooker we have a word that is the pot in which the cook is the the cook puts the things and then cooks cook you don't say cooker you don't say yesterday the cookers did a very fine job of making food after the kumbhabhishekam so many cookers and neither do we have the expression too many cookers spoil the broth no what is the word cook what happened to the er english sutra that we don't understand <laughs> it's all arbitrary the er is gone missing but yet the er's ghost hovers around the word cook right so when i say cook i don't take it as a verb if i say has the cook come i don't take it as a verb i take it as what now because there is something the er the ghost of the er hovers at the end of the word cook without really showing itself it's like the er in the sense of the word cook has become an invisible suffix that has done its job and gone away but it still its effect lingers so the word upanishad plus quip quip you know we can't go into how the quip operates right now okay we are not equipped for that so moving on what uh, uh, suffice it to say that what does the quip do the quip makes the word upanishad into an agent noun and then disappears just like the ghost of er which is informing what the word cook exactly like that very very beautiful so then upanishad now the word is what upanishad what is this upanishad upanishad is that which is meant to do whatever its subject matter is so now with these words we can go into the subject matter of the upanishad which is given by the root verb sad and this sad is understood in three ways visharana gati avasadana yoho visharana visharane and gati avasadana yoho so visharana first meaning dissipates like the fog in the presence of the sun what does it do dissipates but in the evening it's back what the fog so that kind of a dissipation if we are talking of atma agnyanam we do not require that kind of a dissipation which will come back because even if we say it is gone away forever still people don't come to vedanta imagine if if the advertisement for the vedanta retreats would be please come to the retreat for 10 days to enjoy moksha for one day <laughs> what will happen we will have moksha from the retreat itself yeah it will have to be cancelled and so nobody wants that kind of a freedom so shad means disappear dissipate but then it must not come back everything that dissipates in our experience in our knowledge of the jagat always comes back like even a small weed that grows on in in the in between the cobble stones of your driveway and you look at it and say we need to have a talk i told you not to come here i work very hard i have they i have tried to get rid of you i have tried everything i've told you not to come here i'm uprooting you last time i tried one powder it didn't work before that i tried this 
fus fus what is that spray that also did not work now i am going to uproot you and then after that it doesn't come back no 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 it does that's a different reason they are that particular one doesn't come back maybe something else comes back that's different it doesn't come back once it is gone it doesn't come back that meaning is given through the second meaning of the word sad avasadanam unmoolanam uprooting so the word sad has got a kind of a destroying quality to it the root verb sad destroys dissipates uproots never to come back and then what two negative meanings and one positive meaning gamayati leads one first it dissipates it destroys and then it has the meaning the word the root verb sad has the meaning of leading somebody somewhere who where it's given in the prefixes upa near near the word near is so relative from where i am sitting the ashram is near from the standpoint of sailersburg the, uh, the the you can say from the standpoint of the ashram sailersburg is near from the standpoint of sailersburg pennsylvania is near we can go on and on and on all the way to the galaxies and it's all arbitrary near means what so really the prefix upa has to be taken as nearest what is nearest to me what is nearest to me me very good nobody says the person i'm sitting next to no what is nearest to me is myself i know myself intimately i experience the wrong effects of wrong the bad effects of wrong identification i am the one who is experiencing i am the one who is having this problem so therefore i am the one who is needing to i am the subject matter of the upanishad from whom things are being taken away things are dissipating things are being destroyed what is being destroyed what is being taken away what is dissipating what is being uprooted sarvan vratan anarthan anarthab vratan <coughs> all kinds of things i do not need i do not want to have they are being spirited away in other words samsara samsara is the gamut of all kinds of things i do not want to have nothing i want to have nobody wants to feel incomplete nobody wants to feel under uh, uh, you know undercut by others nobody wants to feel unloved nobody wants to feel ignored nobody wants to feel unhappy and the upanishad takes away all those things by saying a very important truth that i am already free of happy uh, sorry sorrow i am already free of strife i am already free of incompleteness through this teaching it takes away first it dissipates the effect of wrong understanding you know it's just like when you want to kill something first you give it a nice bash on the head and then when it's going like this then you <laughs> then you finish it off same with atma agnyanam it's coming to bite you can't immediately kill it because you are yourself stunned you don't know what to do so quickly you bash it on the head with upadesha sahasri the knowledge not the book okay yeah don't say i'm going to bash it literally with not the book it's a big book not the book what do i bash it with 
the knowledge that's in my head stuns this this cobra called atma agnana and when it is stunned it can be taken away and released in a safe place in somebody else's head okay yeah so it can be catch caught and released so that is completely destroyed for me the cobra is not there for me it is no longer a source of fear we hear stories like this all the time especially in florida we hear all these stories where the alligator paid a visit it was only 6 foot long meaning it was a baby <laughs> cuz usually they are 12 13 feet so this baby made havoc in the whole house it just went like this with the tail and the whole couch was destroyed it bit a few other things and then what did they do wildlife rescue came and they threw a dart with a medicine sleeping medicine <laughs> because it was half of the animal is teeth okay that is a, that is what alligator is then after that they got a mouth guard and they got a little leash for it and then they uh, put it in a cage and then uh, relocated it you can't say oh come on you know good boy come on let's go somewhere where you like it you can't do that it's not going to listen same thing with agnyanam first you stun it on the head and then after that you finish it off because it's already stunned so first when we study vedanta this is the, the meaning of the word upanishad itself first the atma agnyanam is stunned and since you are identifying with the atma agnyanam you look stunned like what hit me i don't know what is this knowledge omg is there such a knowledge so but then as the disidentification as the strategic disidentification continues all this i am i am not any one thing i am not separate from anything all this is not none other than me but i am not just my body i am not just my mind so then that agnyanam is caught and released somewhere else is no longer my problem this is wonderful so here so these two meanings what is that visharati avasadayati stuns the agnyanam dissipates it temporarily temporarily renders it motionless and then afterwards it is bashed up avasa destroyed dismembered cut into pieces so that it cannot grow back again oh but why are you talking in such violent terms and negative terms can you tell me something positively gamayati last meaning last word there gamayati means it leads me back to myself who is this you brahman leads me back to brahman and since it leads me back to brahman i feel more like myself i am this i can accept aham asmi this is good sada bhami kada chinna aham apriya this is wonderful so it leads me back to brahman and how by dissipating the ignorance and then by removing the ignorance and destroying it all together ni nischayena definitely ni is for nischaya a certainty there is an assurance on part of mother shruti that if you do this you will really be free and so this is the meaning of the word upanishad let us see what he says here sade rupa nipurvasya we saw that sadehe sadehe upani purvasya upa and ni are the prefixes for what the root verb sad quip uh, quipi cha upanishad bhave quipi means and then followed by quip so followed by quip followed by the suffix quip then you get the word upanishad what does it do mandi karana bhavat cha why is it called upanishad because mandi kriyate mandi karoti 
it's a particular suffix called chvi chvi pratyaya that which is not that is made into that something which is not that is made into that like for example uh, what is that you know they, there are many examples i'm not thinking of it immediately but in the bhagavad gita there are many examples like so many examples are there like for example uh, if something is uh, not cold water water is not cold you know ice cold then i put the glass of water in the fridge so what does the fridge do make that which is not cold cold jalam shithili karoti see and usually this pratyaya goes with bhu kri as you know the verbs to be different forms of the verbs verbs to be bhu kri as shithili karoti shithili bhavati shithili asti like this so it makes that which is not cold cold here mandi karoti manda means what slightly dull manda mandi karoti and what is not dull here my own dullness is not dull <laughs> my dullness because of the avarna and because of my own subjective vikshepa about the world about the the universe about myself about other jivas about ishvara my own vikshepa is in full form it is not dull at all the accoutrements of uh, ignorance and the ignorance itself is certainly not dull it is so strong but that which is so strong this agyanam it makes it dull was it manda before no it wasn't manda but that which wasn't manda it makes it manda mandi karoti makes it manda why does it make it manda because that's the force of it that's the visharana we saw the meanings the three meanings so the mandi karoti means visharati it disintegrates it dissipates it dissipates this then what it dissipates it disintegrates and then garbha dehe mandi karana bhavat means because of its power to to stun the agnyanam and make it all dull the agnyanam thinks oh i have power over you look here you are crying again <laughs> here you are i made you angry just now just now i made you cry i have all the power and the upanishad comes and bashes this agnyanam on the head and the agnyanam just reels stunned mandi karana bhavat means because of its power to make the agnyanam dull the agnyanam which is very strong in me is made to be dull because of that power so Uh, and then because also garbha dehe from the womb shatanat tatha shatanam means the death yeah garbha dehe the list that starts with womb and ends with tomb that's all <laughs> so the whole list from womb to tomb uh, means all six vikaras shat vikara ha what are the six vikaras birth janma yes jayate then vardhate grows up asti keeps on growing is 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 constant and then hmm jayate asti vardhate viparinamate viparinamate blossoms becomes capable of reproduction blossoms after that the other two are best kept silent no apakshiyate and then what gone vinashyati gone so if one of them is mentioned all the other five have to be taken 
garbhadehe the list for which the word garbha is adi the, uh, is at the beginning of which list the word womb is at the beginning of which list and at the end of that very list will be tomb that's all so all the changes shatanath shatanath means the shithilikaranam it freezes it completely destroys the the i as being the notion that i am subject to these changes the uh, it re by revealing that the i is not subject to any of these changes it destroys them thoroughly it destroys the agnyanam and the accoutrements the prasada of agnyanam which is anyatha agnyanam it destroys it totally fully destroys it totally destroys it and so because of that it is called upanishad how should i understand it in english that which makes me shed the things that i don't want that which makes me shed ignorance upanishad that's all you can say that's also nice so then garbha dehe shatana tatha so this is not just a conclusion this is the introduction to the entire work the whole work is being introduced in these 26 verses so it is not the conclusion of the verse but it is an introduction to the entire book so what is the first chapter called upodghata prakaranam in the upadesha sahasri and then the second chapter is called pratishedha prakaranam so upodghata means introductory pratisheda means negation so the subject matter of the second chapter which is very very long i don't know if we'll finish it or not very 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 long only four verses <laughs> second chapter third chapter i think fourth chapter has five verses so some of the chapters are very very small this chapter has four verses and it's going to hone in on one of the most popular pedagogies in vedanta pedagogy means teaching methodology because vedanta is nothing without the teaching methodology and the teaching methodology is what makes it active form of knowledge rather than a static words in the book we are on time now yeah. <laughs> so this is what it is and active live knowledge this is what makes it active and live because the pedagogy is in action the pedagogy is dynamic and vedanta shastra is nothing without the pedagogy the pedagogy is come for free that they are the wrappings in in which the mahavakya is gift wrapped the mahavakya is gift wrapped inside a ped inside various gift wraps called pedagogies that is how we get uh, this knowledge the teaching methodology if it were not there vedanta would not work at all because that means it's as good as reading which we discourage anyway so this negation prakaranam prakaranam means this kind of a chapter a systematic chapter just on negation why do we need negation do i have to keep saying no one yeah so do i have to keep saying this is not a hat this is not an elephant this is not my glasses this is not the microphone this is not the clock this is not the door this is not the window this is not the roof this is not the floor this is not the room this is not an ashram this is not the table this is not the chair do i have to keep saying that no i don't need to do that for this i don't know need to do that for the glasses i don't need to do for this for anything that i have mentioned so far only for this i the negation applies the burning question is why 
Why do I need to know what the I is not? Why can't we just understand what the I is and move along? I should know what the I is. Okay, I don't know myself. So what I should do? I should know what the I is. Okay, I have to go to the teacher. All right. I take myself, I trot off to go see the teacher. Go sit in front of the teacher. The teacher should say what? Tatvamasi. Immediately, straight away. Pragyanam Brahma. Ayam Atma Brahma. Finished. Kaam ho gaya. Finished. The work is done. Why this negation? The negation is there because there is a mistake. What is the cause of this mistake? Is very beautifully talked about in the introductory bhashya, the upodghata bhashya of Adi Shankara in the Brahma Sutra. It is in fact the finest pieces of writing of his that you can ever encounter. One of the finest pieces of writing that has survived for so long. It is just a miracle that we still have it and we can learn from it. He starts off by saying that there are a very unique way to start. He says that in the world, there are two kinds of things that we encounter. One is idam pratyaya gochara. Gochara, that which is known, pratyaya means cognition. That which is known by this cognition. You see, the word is very interesting. Idam, neuter. It is not ayam, masculine, or iyam, feminine. Purposely, the word idam is used. Because if it's masculine or feminine, hint here, it would be alive, it would be sentient. So what are we trying to deal with? We are trying to deal with the world of insentient. The insentient world. There are only two pronouns that are needed. It. It Shabda Gochara, Idam Shabda Gochara, that host of things, entities, which are referred by me as what? It, this. And then there is me. What's that? I, Idam Shabda Gochara. And then, aham shabda gochara. To put it differently, idam pratyaya vishaya and aham pratyaya vishaya. How many idams? Idam, 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 idam. Countless idams. How many ahams? One. Even though in grammar we, have, we say aham, avam, vayam. <laughs> I, we both, we all. But that's only grammar. The grammar reproduces our self-ignorance. Because we have to live in the world and transact. That's why even atma has dual and plural. Atma, atmanav, atmanah. But really how many eyes? One. We are not talking of these eyes. How many eyes? Three, if you're thinking of Lord Shiva. <laughs> Otherwise, for the rest of us, two. But here it is I, the letter I. Aham pratyaya vishaya. That which is a product of I cognition, he says, and that which is a product of this cognition, like this pot, this hat, this table, etc. The two have absolutely nothing to do with one another. This is how he starts. The two have nothing absolutely in common. Why? Look at the differences. How many it's and this is? So many. How many eyes? One. So that's one dissimilarity, one uh, um, area of difference. Between 
Aham and idam. One aham, so many idams, one dissimilarity. The other point of dissimilarity is that between the idams and the aham, one is the revealer, the other one is what? Revealed. Idam is the revealer, right? No. I. Aham is the revealer. Aham is the revealer of what? Idam. So they have a funny relationship. What is the relationship? Revealer, revealed relationship. One more thing not in common. And what is one more dissimilarity? Another dissimilarity is that the revealer doesn't need to be revealed. Whereas the revealed will always need to be revealed. One more dissimilarity. Number four, the revealer also reveals itself. I is self-revealing. So the I reveals itself. Is it not? So if the I reveals itself, can we say the pot also reveals itself? No. So point number three, the revealer does not need to be revealed. Why? That brings us to point number four. The revealer does not need to be revealed because the revealer is self-revealing. The revealer reveals itself. Number five, the world of idams is used by aham. Why? Why is it used by aham? For the sake of pursuing priya and apriya. All the objects in the world, remember here objects include people. As well. People means their bodies, minds, and complex, complexes. All of them, they are all what? They are all there, I think, for my consumption, for my happiness, for my interaction. This is the fifth point. The revealed cannot think because it is inert. The revealed, therefore, does not have this hubris that the I is meant for me, the I is meant for it. No, it is meant for I, I is not meant for it. And the final point, the revealer, the I, the I cognition, that which is understood by I cognition is what? Sentient. And the world of it cognition, this cognition is what? Insentient. Do they have anything in similarity? Is there anything in common? Have I missed out anything? Do they have anything in common? You can say, oh, they have the letter I. Because that's there in it and that's there in I also. But apart from this, is there anything they have in common? No. Adi Shankara then says, what is fascinating and what is absolutely mind-boggling to him is how on earth can the two be mixed up? This Atma self-shining and the world of this cognition is what? Dull, Mandi Krita. It's all dull. It needs to be, the, the light has to be thrown to make it shine. It cannot shine by itself. One is sentient, the other one is dead, inert. One is revealer, other one is revealed. The revealed cannot reveal the revealer. The revealer is self-revealed. A self-revealed revealer. And then, how come? And, this, and we also said, one is used by the other for making life more comfortable for pursuing certain objects of desire. So the revealer is using the objects that are revealed to make life more comfortable. 
despite these differences, how come there is a mix up? Therefore, to understand that there is a mix up, first we have to understand and accept the fact that there is a mix up. The idam becomes aham. When? Give me an example. I am tired. See? What is tired here? Body is tired. And what am I saying instead? I am tired. Idam shariram. Even in the Bhagavad Gita, we see this in the beginning of the 13th chapter. Idam shariram kaunteya. Kshetram iti abhidhiyate. And who is I? Kshetragnya. The knower of this kshetra. Kshetra means idam. Kshetragnyam chapi maam vidhi. Sarva kshetre shubharata. Kshetra kshetragnya yor jnanam. Yad jnanam. Tad jnanam udakhritam. This is the knowledge that has to be studied. Kshetra, the field, meaning with that which is an object of this cognition. Kshetragnya, the knower of the field, the object or the subject matter of I cognition. Even though there should not be a mix-up, there is a mix-up. I take the kshetra, the body, to be myself. It's all metaphorical. Dharma kshetre, kuru kshetre. In the beginning, the first verse of the Bhagavad Gita is all about kshetra, a topic that is picked up again in the 13th chapter. It is fascinating, brilliant. Dharma Kshetre Kuru Kshetre Samaveta Yutsavaha. Kshetra is this body, it's all metaphoric. Kshetra is this body mind sense complex. This is the Kshetra. And then what is this? It's a Dharma Kshetra. It's a place, the human body is a uh, repository of potential Punya, Dharma. Kurukshetra, how is this punya accumulated? By doing. This is all metaphoric. And between dharma, what I have to do and what I want to do, that is the Mahabharata conflict. Between my ragadveshas and between what needs to be done, there is a conflict. So here, the word kshetra is very important. Kshetra, kshetragya. The two cannot be mixed up, cannot get mixed up. It is, nobody says, you know, I am pot. Who says? Nobody says, I pot. But if somebody has a big belly, they'll say, I have a, I have, I am pot bellied. Yeah. <laughs> so, we have to see this, that the mix-up seems preposterous. The mix-up seems Absolutely impossible, yet it takes place. How? And to show this, how does it take place? The Adi Shankara introduces the term Adhyasa. Adhi, on top of something, Asaha, throwing, a projection, Adhyasa. He says, people from all philosophies, all walks of life, know this adhyasa. They all have a understanding of adhyasa. Some people say it is the projection of something over something else. Other people say it is something entirely different. Something seen somewhere where it is not. Some people say it's because of memory. Some other people say it's because of something else. So many things, everybody accepts adhyasa. Adhyasa means seeing something that is not there. Adhyasa. And how can I see something that is not there? It's not possible unless I see something and mistake it to be something else. That's how I can see things that are not there. Even mirage water, I don't see the sand. That's why I see water instead of a sand. So any adhyasa, a few little trivia about adhyasa. 
so what is this adhyasa the adhyasa is a whereby something that is seen whatever subjective perception is there so you have seen something that perception has to have a basis adhisthana without so a few things few things about adhyasa number 1 without a basis for the superimposition the superimposition cannot take place number 1 like take our stock example what is that rope snake if there is no rope can you see snake no at least something should be there there should be a garland that from yesterday's festivity somebody has thrown and then that is also lying in three bends the garland becomes adhisthana or it could be a stick a twig shaped like a snake but something must be there i can't say snake and run and then there is nothing there so the basis for the projection is called adhisthana no translation you know they they say what is that substratum all these things very confusing basis for the projection is called adhisthana number 1 and then that which is misperceived is called is, is so the misperception which is thrown on the adhisthana when the adhisthana is not known is called adhyasa so the basis for the perception is sand sand is the basis for the misperception and the light shining in the eyes and the silica in the sand gives the appearance of what water gives the appearance of there being plenty of water i just want to plunge in this water and cool off from this sand so the basis of that perception adhisthana is sand adhyasa is water now without second point or whichever number i don't know about adhyasa second point yeah second point without adhisthana there can be no adhyasa for any adhyasa to happen adhisthana has to be there and either relatively or absolutely we, we can then go to number 3 and what is number 3 the adhisthana between the adhisthana and the adhyasa there is a very funny relationship even empirically speaking between the rope and rope snake what is the relationship ha huh? satyam mithya relationship except this is mithya within mithya so mithya pratibhasika relationship correct so like this we have to say that one the the adhyasa is false either relatively speaking in the shuktika rajat example or in the rope snake example or absolutely false like i and not i so the adhyasa is false the adhisthana is true in every projection adhyasa is false a false projection that's why it's wrong adhyasa is false adhyasa is wrong adhisthana is true just think of snake and rope that's all it is next point on which number 4 3 make up your mind yeah one of them is adhyasa okay yeah <laughs> which number is it okay so the fourth one when the adhisthana is well known there can be no adhyasa like for example on a well known rope on a seen rope can you project a snake no not even with some help of the imagination can you project a snake on a well known seen rope next point on a totally unknown adhisthana also there can be no adhyasa 
on an unseen snake, like in an, a pitch dark, unseen rope in the pitch dark. You neither see what? The rope, nor do you see what? The snake. Can you see the snake? No. On a totally unknown adhishthana, also there can be no adhyasa. On a fully known adhishthana, also there can be no adhyasa. Then the last point, adhyasa therefore takes place on a partially known object. Very nice. And so we'll be seeing these points more clearly in the evening class, which is meeting at four o'clock. Om Purnamadav Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadagya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Harihi Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Harihi Om Can you give me the hour?